It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Valentin Armheim is a professor of zoology at the University of Basel. He also works as a science journalist and was head of communications at the Swiss Academies of Arts and Sciences. His research and teaching focus on ornithology, conservation biology and statistics. In recent years, he published papers on the role of inferential statistics in our perception of a replication crisis. Together with Sander Greenland and Blake McShane, he wrote a call to quote unquote retire statistical significance in the journal Nature, which was also signed by 800 scientists. So please welcome Valentin. Yeah, thanks, Uba. Very nice that you invited me. I'm just sharing my screen if it's the host has deactivated. Um, I think you sure you must reinvite me as a oh thanks. Okay. So my topic um is, as you can see here, I, I, I promote a much more um, descriptive stance to inferential statistics. But uh, do you see my screen? Uh, I mean, the slides are okay. I see it uh, somehow weird. Um, I'm not a statistician, as you said, I'm a biologist, but I'm interested in inferential statistics because that's our, I always say after the English language, probably our most important tool in most disciplines of science that I'm aware of, actually. So uh, I think this was the second talk in this series where Sam Parsons uh, made a closing remark and that was saying about enhancing reproducibility that none of this process is about whether your hypothesis was supported or not. But as you probably know, if you are a scientist, um, it's all about testing hypotheses. So what we are usually interested in, not only as early career researchers, but as researchers in, in general, is to put forward an hypothesis. That's also what um, referees and journal editors and uh, Swiss National Science Foundation referees request from us, that we have a clear cut hypothesis and that we tell um, how we are going to test this and the aim is to either support it or to reject it. And as you probably know, at least that's what I observe, most people would like to support the hypothesis and not to reject it. Um, and I think this is a problem, although this, as I said, still is what we also teach our students in our department of environmental um, sciences. And the reason why I think that's a problem is that uh, reality, reality is frequently inaccurate. Um, hypothesis testing claims to be to making you able to make some uh, decisive decision based on one single study or a, a limited series of studies and then to publish this as support or refutation of, a, of an hypothesis. And I think this is in most cases questionable. And this is a classic picture um, from an early paper of Ioannidis and uh, they collected effect sizes. So that's um, relative risks of cancer. And you can see, so to the right side of the x-axis, uh, uh, risk ratio is larger than one means uh, increased risk and smaller risks are decreased risk protects against cancer. And you see that wine is either good or bad against cancer and so forth. Um, so is this bad or good? I'd say this is how science works. It's just a bit messy and there's no use to take one of those studies and claim based of crossing some any statistical value that you have found something decisive. Also making a claim based on the effect size alone is worth close to nothing, I think. And uh, Tupa, you mentioned our uh, nature commentary. So this was science larger, uh, so, um, uh, quicker than I thought by about 800 persons and is since then widely discussed. 
but this is really just one piece uh, in, an, in a long row of papers that appeared since about 100 years. And the reason why we were able to write this nature commentary was that all three authors um, contributed papers in a special issue of the American Statistician. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, it's, it's worthwhile just to scan those papers and to read one or two of those if you want. And, and then there were editors um, who are partly working for the uh, ASA, ASA, American Statistical Association, and they concluded that it is time to stop using the term statistically significant entirely. And it's also worth to, uh, to emphasize that this is not the official stance of the um, ASA, it's just the editors of this uh, journal that said this and some of the authors, or many of the authors actually. But um, our call to retire statistical significance was then, or to the call to embrace uncertainty was then embraced by many, many people. Among them, here you see some uh, people of the clinical trial unit in Basel. And there was a Congress of the Department of Clinical Research earlier this year. And they, might, they made those nice t-shirts for all of us. So I give a quick talk there as well. And I think one reason why several statisticians I met are quite happy about this movement is that they are often approached by scientists, uh, physicians, medical researchers, researchers of all other fields, um, asking how can you help us um, so that we are actually able to either say um, we found evidence in favor or against a hypothesis. And then sometimes statisticians must say, no, it's, first, it's from one single study, it's tricky. And second, um, your uncertainty in your particular study is just too high to be able to say that. And then the question is what to do. And one answer is um, let's just accept it. That's what we mean with uh, embracing uncertainty. As I said, it's, uh, it's absolutely not new. So nothing we say or write is new. The first paper I'm aware of that clearly said um, statistical significance is a problem was published almost exactly 100 years ago. Edwin Boring, who um, also the term statistical significance was not invented by Fisher, it's actually older. Also the p-value was not invented by Fisher, it's actually older. And this boring says scientific generalization is a broader question than mathematical description. And that's uh, basically the main topic of my talk. And one way to see this is um, to look also uh, at a paper by Ioannidis, uh, also an early paper, um, who showed a meta-analysis. So that's the overall effect of the, at the bottom of this image of studies investigating antibiotic prophylaxis and colon surgery. And you can look at all those um, uh, point estimates and compatible con confidence intervals, 95% confidence intervals, we call them now compatibility intervals. And you see that they uh, jump around all over the place. And if you are familiar with this construct, you with, with one view, see that half of those estimates is actually not significantly different from the null hypothesis of um, uh, the risk ratio of one. Because um, about half of the con those confidence interval touches the null value. Luckily, they all have been published so that the researchers were able to, to make a meta-analysis and say that uh, on average, the overall effect size uh, is, as you can see here, so there seems to be um, some value in applying anti antibiotic uh, prophylaxis in colon surgery. But the point is, one single of those studies is not sufficient to say anything, and certainly it's, it's, neither, it's neither okay to say, look, the point estimate that we found here, very low, highly significant, this is true. And it's also not good to say, look, this point estimate here is, uh, there's actually a risk increase, and, but it's not significant, so we found nothing. Second, um, similar drawing, um, and this differs from the earlier one, and that is actually, this is uh, simulated data on a true effect size of 10. So uh, Joseph Cumming, who made this drawing, 
was, was simulating taking samples, um, sample size was 32, power was, uh, I'd say, about average. Most of our studies in my field actually have uh, power that is worse than 50%. And you can see that picking one of those studies is basically like closing your eyes, picking one of the p-values with a power of 50% given that the effect size is actually, this is a true effect, half of the studies will then be non-significant. And there's absolutely no value in saying that uh, a study with a, with a high p-value shows that there's nothing or a study with a low value shows that uh, effect size is 20, like in this case, because we know the true effect size is 10. So um, this was the famous dance of p-values. If you want, just to show again, um, look, if you don't know it, go to this YouTube page. It's a very nice video by Geoff Cumming, really worthwhile to have a look at that, the dance of the p-values and the dance of the confidence intervals. But our, one of our messages is don't, please don't blame the p-value because the p-value is exactly was invented for showing this unreliability in the data. It's not the p-value that is unreliable, but um, the p-value is actually reliable and saying that the averages from which in this case, the p-value was calculated, they dance around all over the place. So don't blame the p-value, but blame yourself if you make a strict yes or no decision based on a p-value threshold of any size. In most cases 0.05, of course. We call this dichotomania, and we say that um, making any of those decisions based on one single study or on several studies in a row means having overconfidence. This is from one of our papers. I'll let you read it yourself. So this was um, a paper that we wrote in reaction to some criticism to our nature commentary. And I put Andrew Gilman in bold here because this is a classic uh, Andrew Gilman sentence and it's actually him who provided this for our paper. Um, but this is exactly how I feel as well. Um, the replication crisis has arisen because unreliable findings are presented as reliable. So I'd say, a large part of the replicability crisis is um, due to the fact is due to wrong communication because we all learn to make strong statement based on single papers. This is actually a first summary. So um, science suffers from overconfident titles and dichotomania. Reliable conclusions can only be drawn using cumulative evidence from multiple studies and overconfidence in results from single studies leads to the partly wrong perception of a general replication crisis. A third point is that overconfidence in small p-values leads to a distorted literature. And I hope one slide on that is sufficient. I'm talking about uh, the so-called effect size inflation, also winner's curse or truth inflation. I like the term truth inflation very much. And you have already seen those slides. I hope you saw the paper. And was shown also in another talk in the series. Um, this was the Open Science Collaboration. They made 100 replications. And um, I think on uh, 97 of those pardon, original studies, um, they found what we call significant p-values, so p-values that were smaller than 0.05. And what they found is first that the replication found in most cases larger p-values. And more importantly, they found that the effect sizes in the replication studies were only about half as large as the effect sizes in the significant um, original studies. And now the point is that those replications had a large sample size and I would trust them more than I would trust the replications. And the main reason is that the replications as often happens and it happens to me to people select the results in some way. It's not necessarily based on a significant result, but still in most cases, I think it is. And the point is that usually only the largest effect sizes will become significant. Unless you have something like 100% power, which in most cases is not possible. Um, 
So, and if you select um, something for their significance, for its significance, then you, by definition, select a point estimate that was larger than other point estimates. And if you then, uh, then if you have your famous file drawer and some of your studies are disappearing in those file drawers, then the meta-analyses like the one I showed in the beginning will not reliable anymore because um, only the, the large effects estimates are published and this is what actually people see. So in most cases, early results on some pattern are overestimated and then replication results are much more reliable and the effect sizes tend to be smaller. Last point I actually want to make is that overconfidence in larger p-values leads to the so-called false proofs of the null hypothesis. And this is actually the starting point of our discussion um, last year. Um, what we wanted to present in the Nature commentary was this study. And Nature, the Nature editors found this is politically too loaded because it's about antidepressants and autism in children. And they were a bit afraid that this would be perceived as blaming the mothers for taking pills or so. But nonetheless, I, this is a striking example. So the study uh, found a risk ratio of one, a hazard ratio of 1.61. That is a risk increase of 61%. But they also found a confidence interval that uh, spans uh, roughly from no effect to a risk increase of 159%. And since this confidence interval touches the zero value of a risk ratio of one, they say um, compared with no exposure, not associated, associated with autism. And we think this is bad. And one reason is that um, we can show you uh, so-called compatibility graph. So this is published in a new paper by Sandra Greenland and Seth Raffi. And here you see that there are lots of other non-zero values that are highly compatible with the data and the model from this study. And you can see that, uh, so on the, on the y-axis, you have the p-values, or you can also co call them compatibility index if you want. And you see here at a um, hazard ratio of one, this was the tested null hypothesis, this gets a p-value of about uh, 0.05. This is what they found. And then you have lots of other values in this, on this x-axis. And if you would take them as null hypothesis and test them against your data using your model, you would find that, of course, the value that is most compatible with the data given their model is what they observed. And this is the observed um, hazard ratio of 1.61, gets a p-value of one. But also all the other values are highly compatible with the data. And then there are lots of other values that are also compatible with the data that just get a p-value that is smaller than uh, 0.05. So it's, it's really hard to draw any strong conclusion from those data because it's, uh, uncertainty is very high. But certainly it's, it's ridiculous to say that this study actually established that the, the null hypothesis of no risk increase is true because it's just one of the values that are compatible with the data. So we say take a descriptive approach and describe what you found. So it's okay to say that you found actually a point estimate, a risk ratio of 61%. However, it's only okay as long as you also say that under the same model, every hypothesis from no increase up to, up to uh, uh, about 160% hazard increase was highly compatible with your data. And then a closing remark should be in such a paper, okay, our results, our study, our results were imprecise, imprecise, but our result is most consistent with what actually earlier studies also found, because earlier studies found a very similar risk ratio. So once again, drawing the conclusion that there is no risk increase, especially if uh, people then look at the literature as ridiculous and dangerous. And it's going to be published because um, Medscape, probably you know it, uh, uh, widely used uh, um, newspaper, um, what is this? Uh, I think it's, it's sent via um, email. I'm not, I'm not receiving those. 
But what they say, and that's what clinicians, uh, physicians read, is that antidepressants in pregnancy, there's no link to autism. And then they even write here in the, in the second sentence, use of antidepressants does not cause autism. And this is dangerous and wrong. And wrong interpretations really abound in the published literature and in each and every discipline that I saw so far, it's, uh, it's always around uh, half or 30% to perhaps 70% of, of uh, journal articles who take larger p-values to establish a null relation, a zero effect. Okay, and this is also absolutely not new. Fisher said it in 1935 already. I'm sure there have been people who said it even earlier. Second example, very briefly, um, that's about mortality and septic shock. And the authors are um, comparing two treatments and one treatment that they found a hazard ratio of uh, 0.75. So one treatment had a 25% reduction in mortality, but since the p-value was 0.06, non-significant, they say did not reduce all cause mortality, paper from last year. And also last year, there were two people at least who reacted to this. So David Spiegelhalter from the UK says, this is appalling. And then Ken Ruthman, famous epidemiologist from the US says, this illustrates how reliance on statistical significance may be killing people. And then in later in a tweet, he asked the question, if you were a patient with a septic shock, would you look at the p-value at whether it crosses some threshold or would you just take the treatment that uh, has a point estimate that at least in this study shows a 20%, 25% reduction of risk? So um, just half an hour ago, I saw on Twitter by uh, Kornick uh, Martin van Smeden, where do they teach that high point estimates with huge confidence intervals can be interpreted as not statistically significant, but clinically important? Such a weird thing to say. And this is a criticism that I hear now often that people are actually using our nature commentary to describe their non-significant results, which in my view is actually, is actually what they should do. They should publish their point estimate, they should describe the uncertainty and say they have a large p-value. But it's of course not okay to say that what they found is clinically important. And this is then by Andrew Althaus, um, the reply, well-intentioned though it is, that's very nice. The effect size would be clinically important if this is the actual true effect. Okay, and this is the important thing to note. And then Martin responds with saying, and to me, this sounds now very weird. So where I grew up, um, people were not indoctrinated that p-values are bad. People were indoctrinated with that without a p-value crossing some threshold, you'll not get promotion, you'll not get papers, you certainly not get research money and no professorship. And now in a way, I'm... Um, um, uh, I don't know, would I be happy about the counter movement? No, of course not, because um, p-values are not bad. <laughs> and I'm coming to this point with uh, another tweet by Sandra Greenland from this summer. He says, p-values are limited and useful tools for assumption evaluation that insanely got adapted as universal truth or records. That's how I see it and how Sandra see it. Okay, so that's our message. And I'm coming actually to the almost second last slide already, reply to false, what we regard as false criticism. We don't want to ban p-values. Most statisticians I know, I think I did I meet, I mean, there are some Bayesians and that's, a, that's another discussion that there are now people who say Bayesian statistics is the solution for everything, but um, I like it, I use it myself, but it's not the solution for everything. P-values are also not the solution for everything. We don't want to ban anything. We don't want to ban even statistical significance. There are certainly um, circumstances where it's good and important to use it, 
but whoever selects results for their statistical significance should be aware of what he or she does and discuss it. And that's, in, in, at least in my field, biology, that's, I see that people want to select uh, people that I see that people, even in our discussions in this uh, seminar series, uh, my impression is that we think we can use or we should use statistics to somehow let us then argue that something is there or is not there and um, somehow select things to be reliable or not. And this is dangerous. As I said, we don't say that uh, larger p-values should be reported as trustworthy. We say that we should report everything. And then if we have a small p-value, this doesn't mean that something is there. Actually, I'm really against this entire sentence, something is there, because this is not the question. In most cases, that in my research, at least the question is how large is the effect. Um, and certainly, it's not about larger p-values saying that something is not there. And we also don't say that yes or no decisions are not needed. We only say um, the p-value, at least in the Fisherian sense and the sense that we like, is uh, not a decision tool. It's actually something that gives you, that shows you evidence against a model. And one of the assumptions of the model is that, you, that a certain null hypothesis is true. So decisions, um, and I'm talking about decisions, whether to pursue uh, research further or decisions maybe to accept uh, that the opponent has won the American presidency or whatever. Decisions should not be based only on a single threshold, but also on the costs, benefits, and likelihoods of potential consequences of this decision. And I'm not going to speculate what this means with respect to the discussion on on whether and why Trump does not accept that he was, um, that he lost. This is um, what I usually tell my students. The first three points I already tried to explain. And I'm going to start with a fourth point. So I really want myself and my students to de describe my point estimate as long as they and I also describe the interval estimates. So of course, it's very important to, to gorge uncertainty and to write about uncertainty in the paper, rather than saying yes or no to hypotheses. And this is a problem because I know that most colleagues actually want to test their hypotheses. Um, use p-values and other statistics in a continuous fashion. Use confidence intervals as compatibility intervals. So it's fine to describe the practical implications of all the values inside the interval. And in most cases, this means describing the, uh, the two um, uh, endpoints of the interval. And it's also fine to say, look, this is what I actually observed. This is my point as to that as long as you describe the limits of the interval as well. And be aware that all this really hinges on the, on the assumption that everything, that all assumptions in your model are correct. And one of the assumptions is that you actually measured correctly or that your, uh, uh, most cases, your sampling was random and all those things um, that usually apply. And, that we are sometimes aware of, but there are also many assumptions that we are actually don't test because we are not even aware of them. And one of the assumptions is that the null hypothesis is true if we are using null hypothesis significance testing. Careful assessment and description of uncertainty is the core motivation for statistical practice, not making decisions based on some threshold. And with this, I'd like to close and I'd like to um, inform you that in Switzerland, we now have a Swiss reproducibility network since about one month. Uh, there was a launch meeting about one month ago via Zoom, of course. And this has local notes at uh, all universities and many research institutes. And it's actually, we are starting to build it. So there are also people in Switzerland, uh, in, in Basel, becoming interested in this. And I heard that also in this group, you are discussing whether you could participate in one way or the other. With this, I would like to thank you and wish you a very nice evening. <laughs>